warships are the ultimate symbol of a nation's military might. These things are monstrous wonders of technology. Enormous vessels, crewed by thousands, bristling with massive guns and powerful aircraft, they can deliver terrifying destruction and turn the tide of history. The ship was built to win the war. Uh, there was no other reason. From the beginning of the 20th century to the present day, these are the stories of classic warships. From dreadnoughts to Bismarck, to Japan's monster sea warrior, Yamato. The American superships, Wisconsin, Lexington, and Enterprise. To today's cutting edge Royal Navy carriers. These are the world's greatest warships. September the 2nd, 1945, officers of the Japanese High Command boarded a mighty American battleship to officially surrender to the Allies. It is my earnest hope that from this solemn occasion, a better world shall emerge out of the blood and carnage of the past. The ceremony took place on board an Iowa-class battleship a huge floating fortress and fitting theater to end the bloodiest war in human history. A war that saw the rise and fall of the greatest warships the world would ever see. Bristling leviathans capable of brutal violence, but also facing a fight for survival from a new deadly threat. These were the giant battleships of World War II. The template for these ships of the 1940s was laid down decades earlier, before World War I, with the revolutionary HMS Dreadnought in 1906. Fifteen years of non-stop arms race and then the war itself resulted in huge fleets of these warrior ships. As the First World War comes to an end, Dreadnought battleships are still the currency by which nations measure their power and their prestige. But the cost of having serious naval status was crippling already weak post-war economies. Something had to be done. All the main naval powers, the United States, Great Britain, um, Japan, France and Italy are invited to Washington for a conference. And the treaty that results from that puts a cap on naval spending and naval allocation for all the signatory powers. You get arms limitation to try and reduce the number of battleships, the size of battleships, um, and the capacity and capability of battleships. A 10-year hiatus on battleship building was also agreed, plus a maximum weight of 35,000 tonnes. So when building started again in the mid-1930s, battleship designers were confronted with a dizzying array of challenges. A battleship is a compromise between three primary factors. That's gunnery, armored protection, and its propulsion system. Naval author Mark Steele is an expert on battleship specifications. The Washington Naval Treaty was in effect for most of the 1930s up until 1937. And with that 35,000 ton limit, it was very hard to build a balanced ship with heavy firepower, good protection, and a high speed. You can never fit all of these systems aboard a single hull to the degree that you might like. What everyone's doing is looking for innovative ways of trying to keep within treaty limits, but at the same time give your ship the biggest punch you can. That punch came from guns that by the late 30s were more powerful than ever. So what you're looking at here is a 14-inch naval gun. This is almost as big as guns get in the Royal Navy. This can fire a shell that is the weight of a small car. So that's what naval warfare is at this point in time. They're hurling, basically, VW Beetles across the sea at each other, and 22 miles range. So they're firing over the horizon. They're firing much further than you can see. For its newest battleship, the Royal Navy wanted 10 of these guns on board, but in less turrets to keep the weight down. So two of the turrets would need to house an unprecedented four guns. HMS King George V 
Tonnage, 35,000. Armament, 10 14-inch guns. 16, 5.2... Four 14-inch guns in one turret. Now, that is an interesting concept. It saves a huge amount of weight. Usually you have two guns per turret, so you're saving basically 250 tonnes of steel weight from the turret alone. It was a very, very clever and inventive way of trying to solve a very difficult problem. They were accustomed to building twin gun turrets, they'd built the triple turret arrangement, but they'd never tried a quadruple before. With the King George V class, the British thought they'd built the best warship possible under treaty restrictions. Germany's new navy begins to take powerful shape. From the yards of but not everyone was playing by the rules. Hitler's Nazi party had risen to power, pledging to rebuild Germany's military might. He had already defiantly torn up the hated Versailles Treaty, which restricted Germany to a tiny coastal patrol navy. Now, on the eve of World War II, the launch of Bismarck makes a powerful statement. The Bismarck wasn't only a military weapon, it was also a status symbol, indicating um, the regaining of German sea power, also a symbol for German technological achievements. Hitler had agreed with Britain to stick to the Washington Treaty maximum tonnage. 35,000 tons of German steel is launched in the presence of the Führer himself. The truth was, Bismarck weighed over 41,000 tons. They cheated in their ship sizes. That extra 6,000 tons is translated into quite a lot of extra military value. Bismarck was one quarter of a kilometer long and 36 meters across her beam, as wide as an eight-lane motorway. She was crewed by over 2,000 men. Steam turbines drove three huge screws, giving the Bismarck a 30-knot top speed and a cruising range of over 16,000 kilometers. Her eight 38-centimeter guns could fire their shells over 19 kilometers with deadly accuracy. A thick belt of rock-hard armor protected her waterline, turrets and magazines. Bismarck was quite simply the most advanced, most fearsome ship ever built. Now Hitler could unleash his rule-breaking secret weapon on the Atlantic convoys, Britain's wartime lifeline. May 1941. German armies controlled half of Scandinavia, North Africa and most of Europe, but not Britain. After the RAF had repelled his air force, thwarting his plans to invade, Hitler knew he must still defeat Britain to win the war. He focused on its Achilles heel, the vulnerable but crucial Atlantic convoys. Hitler knew that Britain was dependent on vast amounts of war supplies coming from America and also coming from the British Empire up around Africa into uh, Britain. The German Navy employed her vessels not in a vain sea battle in the North Sea, but against the British lines of communication because these had been identified as the weak strategic point of Britain. German naval command made a bold decision. Bismarck, along with only a heavy cruiser as support, was tasked to attack Allied shipping. From its main base at Scapa Flow in Scotland, the Royal Navy still controlled the North Sea. So Bismarck sneaked along the coast of Norway and past Iceland, where it could get at the vulnerable convoys shuttling between Britain and America. Now those convoys are perfectly structured to protect the merchant ships from submarines. What you want to do when you have a submarine threat is put all your merchant ships together and surround them by smaller ships that can sink submarines. Job done. The only time that job isn't done is if a battleship gets amongst them, because a battleship can sink any one of those little escorts at long range and then polish off 
every merchant ship, firing its main guns at a range of 22 miles. As Bismarck set sail, her captain, Ernst Lindman, was in optimistic mood. I have the comforting feeling that with this ship, I will be able to accomplish any mission assigned to me. We have for the first time in years a ship whose fighting qualities are at least a match for any enemy. Had Bismarck succeeded, had it got into a convoy and sunk a dozen ships, and then got home safely, that would have been something we'd had real problems dealing with. Like Hitler, Winston Churchill knew that the stakes were high. Britain could not lose what he called this Battle of the Atlantic. Without victory, he said, there is no survival. Next, Bismarck made her dash for the Atlantic past Iceland. Here, she was detected by British patrols. Realizing this may be their only chance to catch her, HMS Prince of Wales, a brand new King George V-class battleship, was ordered to set sail. Prince of Wales was still being finished off in Scapa Flow. There were civilian engineers on the ship finishing off its guns, but it was dispatched straight away to go and search for the Bismarck. Andrew Chung is curator of the ship's plans archive at the Royal Maritime Museum in Greenwich. These once top secret sketches compare Bismarck's design to the design of the HMS King George V class. What the Admiralty was extremely keen to know was how Bismarck compared to the King George V class battleships, which are of course our most modern battleships at the time. What we're looking at is a very basic general arrangement drawing of the two ships. What is really remarkable about the two ships is not the differences between them, but how incredibly similar they both are in terms of the weight of offensive power they both carry. But with an extra and illicit 6,000 tons to play with, Bismarck's designers have been able to build in a clear advantage. Bismarck is a much wider ship than the King George V. This is what allowed the Germans to build in significantly more watertight compartmentalization and this made the ship not only a better and more stable gun platform, but also made her that much harder to flood and therefore sink. On May 24th, 1941, the Prince of Wales, along with post-World War I battlecruiser HMS Hood, caught up with Bismarck. Hood was Britain's largest warship. She was fast, but lightly armoured and a soft target for Bismarck. Her artillery and the level of training of her gun crews was excellent. So only shortly after Bismarck had started to fire at HMS Hood, the first shells hit the ship. One of Bismarck's huge shells had penetrated Hood's deck, igniting the aft magazine where ammunition and other explosives were stored. A sailor on board the Prince of Wales witnessed the scene. The whole of the vast ship was enveloped in a flash of flame and smoke, which rose high into the air in the shape of a giant mushroom. All that remained, apart from bits of wreckage, was a flicker of flame and smoke on the water's surface. There was no time to abandon her. Out of Hood's crew of 1,418, only three survived. The brand new Prince of Wales had made a poor showing too, her revolutionary foregun turrets proving highly unreliable. Quite often, the quadruple turrets didn't work. No, 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 no. There are gaps in the operating of the 14-inch turrets. Despite failings, one shell had landed a telling blow. Prince of Wales managed to strike Bismarck up near the bow, which robbed her of the ability to get about a thousand tons of fuel oil from the bow tanks. Those hits ended Bismarck's sortie into the Atlantic, and the decision was made to run down towards France to try and get her repaired. 
Bismarck was on the run, and her commander, Admiral Lutyens, knew the Royal Navy would be out for revenge. Seamen of the battleship Bismarck, you have covered yourself with glory. The sinking of the battlecruiser Hood has not only military but psychological value. For she was the pride of Great Britain. Henceforth, the enemy will try to concentrate his forces and bring them into action against us. She had been observed by a flying boat of coastal command in a hunt which will echo down the corridors of time. Almost everything the Royal Navy has that will float is put into the Atlantic to try and find Bismarck. With that many assets looking for Bismarck, it's very hard for her to get away. She was leaving an oil trail behind her, she went, which would make it easier for her to be located. Eventually, she was attacked by British swordfish torpedo bombers. These old-fashioned biplanes came in at 80 miles an hour, dropped their torpedoes. One swordfish torpedo disabled Bismarck's rudder, locking her into a tight turn. With his ship now a sitting duck, Lutyen sent a defiant final message to his superiors. Ship unable to maneuver. We will fight to the last shell. Long live the Führer. Decisive blow comes at the end. Bulk of the home fleet catches up with her and she is pummeled from long range by British battleships. HMS King George V, sister ship of the Prince of Wales, was one of the first on the scene. Her foregun turrets were better, and along with HMS Rodney, they scored hundreds of hits on the stricken battleship. Even Bismarck's formidable armor could only take so much. A British eyewitness recalled, Considering the punishment she had received already, she fought back magnificently, and one can but admire the courage of those men. We passed within a couple of miles of her, just as she sank at 1100 hours, and by then, she was just a smoking wreck. The Navy was out for revenge, and the Bismarck paid in full. At home in Britain, the sinking is a huge boost for flagging morale. Yep. Yep. It was a fine looking ship, but you just couldn't take it. For Germany, the loss is also profound. The Bismarck was cherished as the blossom of German shipbuilding technology, a powerful ship, the largest ship afloat, almost unsinkable, and now this vessel is lost. And um, this is, of course, a massive psychological setback. The loss of Bismarck had a profound effect upon uh, Hitler's strategic thinking via via his navy. He felt very keenly the loss of prestige uh, uh, that had resulted from this mission, which, to be honest, had been a really bad idea in the first place. Adolf Hitler really has very, very little interest in navies. He famously said at one point that he's on land I am a hero and at sea I am a coward. Hitler decided his U-boats could take care of the Atlantic convoys from beneath the waves. The next month, he turned back to what he knew best, fighting on land. In June 1941, Hitler ordered the invasion of the Soviet Union. Within four months, his armies were at the door to Moscow. The Soviets needed help. The US and Britain started to send convoys of ships loaded with crucial supplies of arms, equipment and food from Scotland via the freezing Northern Ocean to the northern seaports of Russia. Convoys were getting through, and Hitler found his armies fighting Soviets in American trucks, Canadian tanks, and British aircraft. He needed an effective weapon to try and stop the convoys. Tirpitz, launched in 1941, was slightly bigger and faster than Bismarck. She was Hitler's last great battleship 
and she would not follow in her sister's wake. He doesn't want to risk another prestige ship uh, on an operation that would probably only result in its destruction. It results in Tirpitz being sent to the relative security of the Norwegian fjords. And we see a very interesting reversion almost to First World War naval thinking where we have this incredibly powerful warship, but we dare not use it in case we lose it. By parking his last great battleship in a fjord, Hitler had stumbled upon a way to make Tirpitz very effective without risking her at sea. Being held in Norway had a paralyzing effect on the, the British and meant that the British had to keep a number of their heavy ships in Scapa flow as a direct deterrent to the Tirpitz coming out. The beneficiaries were the Japanese because the British had to have two fleet carriers and three battleships tied up in Scapa flow watching Tirpitz when they were desperately needed in the Far East. The war was still in the balance and Churchill wanted Tirpitz sunk. It would take the best minds and bravest men two years to do what must be done. The sinking of the Tirpitz would be a new victory, the destruction of this last great visible symbol of German sea power. June 1942. Hitler's jackboot was still firmly on Europe's throat. His U-boats were wreaking havoc in the Atlantic. But what was left of his surface navy was deployed with great care. Tirpitz skulked in the fjords of Norway, menacing the convoys that supplied the Soviets as they pushed back against the German invaders. Churchill and the Admiralty feared the damage a rampaging Tirpitz could inflict on these convoys. One was unlucky enough to be at sea when a message that Tirpitz was on the move was intercepted. A protective escort was sent to intercept her, leaving the convoy defenseless against U-boats and the Luftwaffe. The threat of Tirpitz coming out was enough for them to order the scattering of convoy PQ-17, with the result that that uh, convoy was slaughtered. The great irony being that Tirpitz hadn't even really sorted at all to come after the convoy, but it illustrates the, the, the fear which the presence of this ship engenders in British naval minds. So again, you see this worth and the function of, of capital ships, of, of huge battleships, as symbols of power. The Tirpitz-induced panic had caused the loss of 24 out of 35 ships. Churchill's obsession with attacking and destroying the ship he called the Beast intensified. Her location was known, but getting at Tirpitz was a different matter. She was very well protected floating in a kind of, of cage with a kind of steel nets around her, protecting her against uh, attacks from U-boats or submarines. There was a huge number of anti-aircraft batteries around, in addition to her own considerable anti-aircraft armament. And uh, they had also devices to, to set up kind of artificial mist or uh, fog just to, to cover the vessel from, from air attack. Even if all this was overcome, Tirpitz had a formidable last line of defence. So what I'm sat on here is a piece of solid Krupp steel, 14 inches thick, and this is part of the main armour belt from the German battleship Tirpitz. When you build a battleship, you can't armour the entire thing. It would be so heavy, it would sink like a stone. So all you can do is pick the most important parts of the ship and protect them. So this belt was designed to run for hundreds of feet along the side of the ship, and that's there to protect the engines, the boilers, the ammunition magazines, um, and the shell rooms. This is basically Tirpitz's coat of armour. A dozen attacks by aircraft from carriers and long-range bombers had made little impact. But 
like all battleships, Tirpitz had a soft underbelly. It was this lightly armored lower hull that would be targeted next. So you see attacks by X-Craft miniature submarines, which can sneak in through the defenses without anyone seeing and plant charges underneath Tirpitz, um, and the, the impact will kind of shake and damage her hull, and that, that works fairly well, but doesn't sink the ship. With Tirpitz soon fully operational once again, the British command turned to a man who had a track record of destroying hard-to-hit targets. Barnes Wallace was the man behind the dam-busting bouncing bombs that had caused havoc in Germany's industrial heartland. Ian Murray is an expert on his work. Barnes Wallace is, is up with the best British inventors, certainly of the, of the 20th century. He had such unusual ideas, many of which were proven to work successfully. To destroy Tirpitz, Wallace initially adapted his dam-busting bomb to attack a ship's hull. He called his idea Highball. The workshops at Portsmouth's historic dockyard have painstakingly restored a highball that Ian and his team retrieved from Loch Striven in Scotland. It was here bombing runs were practiced by specialist pilots and aircraft in preparation for an attack on Turpins. The Mosquito was a small bomber, but it had no armament. It was extremely fast. A squadron of probably nine uh, of those aircraft would have flown up the fjord, drop it at the correct distance, so the, the bomb would have skipped in, hit the uh, foot-thick armour on the side of the, the ship, uh, but it wouldn't have exploded there, it would have continued to spin and it would have rolled down underneath the keel of the ship where the, the steel was only uh, probably an inch or two at the most, and it would have detonated there and blown a large hole in the bottom of the ship. That was all good in theory, but the Germans were one step ahead, as proven by Tirpitz's next mooring. The Germans very inconveniently had the ship positioned in a fjord where it was very difficult to attack by aerial torpedo or with highball, because it needed a, a reasonable run-up and an approach to the, the ship in the fjord. It would have been very difficult to attack it broadside on, unfortunately. The Air Ministry asked Wallace to think again. He revisited an older, more conventional design for a dam-busting bomb, one that didn't bounce. Wallace had originally proposed a very large bomb which would have gone deep into the ground. So the Air Ministry sort of said, could we try some of those? They had success with a six-ton version, which was called Tallboy. Tallboy was one of the most awesome weapons built in Britain during the war. Only a stripped-down Lancaster heavy bomber had the power to carry the 12,000-pound earthquake bomb. A normal bomb would just have been a single metal casting full of explosive with a, a straight tail on the back. Tallboy was machined to have a, a lovely smooth casing and they were balanced so that the, the weight was distributed equally. Wallace also borrowed an idea from the, the archers which was to on the, the tail fins of the bomb, he actually angled them at five degrees. So as the bomb fell, and it would have been falling for something like 30 seconds, the bomb would actually have spun, and that sort of gyroscopically stabilized it, and it gave it a nice straight flight path all the way down to the ground. On November the 12th, 1944, the 24th mission against Tirpitz was launched. Two Lancaster squadrons dropped 29 tall boys from high altitude over the fjord. That massive explosion set off the, the magazines inside the Tirpitz and it, it turned over within a few minutes. So Tirpitz, like Bismarck, was lost to history. Thousands of miles away, war was raging in the Pacific where the American Navy was unleashing an all-new battleship on the Japanese Imperial Fleet. It remains an icon of American warship building at its best, the Iowa-class battleship. 
The Iowas have a very good claim for being the finest battleships ever produced. They have the right balance of armour, speed and armament. It's absolutely nailed it. They were the first US battleships completely free of treaty restrictions, which meant that the US could pour the whole of its production capacity into these vessels. Almost every battleship before has had to compromise somewhere. Those ones get the balance absolutely perfectly. This is USS Wisconsin, one of four Iowa-class battleships launched in 1943 all still afloat as museums. Follow me into the chart room. Clayton Allen looks after Wisconsin, now permanently moored in the naval port of Norfolk, Virginia. We are the last battleship in the US Navy battleship fleet, BB-64. There are no more battleships in the US Navy. So what we're seeing here is Broadway. It's the longest continuous passage on the ship. It's 250 feet long, it's six feet wide, and the sailors adopted that name Broadway because on a hot summer steamy night and all the lights are lit up, and so they're trying to connect to home. The original design complement for this ship was to have 1,900 men, but because of the threat of kamikazes, they added more gunner's mates. That way we could pull watch in the guns 24 hours a day. They added 1,000 extra men, so about a crew of 2,900. Crew working inside the ship in key operational areas were well protected. This is what we call the Citadel, and if we were under attack, you would want to be inside this space. Inside this 17 inches of armor, the lookouts, the helmsman, the lee helmsman, the captain, the officer of the deck, all these men are protected, and they have to be inside here during combat. These were very advanced ships, even by the standards of World War II. They were very heavily armed with nine 16 inch guns, most importantly were their electronic eyes, their sensor suits in terms of search radars, gunnery radars. Now we're going to go down to the heart and the soul. We're going down seven decks. Welcome to engine room one. We have four engine rooms. Collectively, each engine room at maximum speed can produce 53,000 shaft horsepower. So at 33 knots, or 37 and a half miles an hour, that's 212,000 shaft horsepower. That's amazing when you're pushing around 58,000 tons of ship, men, and armor. With a range of 25,000 miles, Wisconsin could almost circumnavigate the globe. So we use a lot of fuel, 2.3 million gallons of fuel every two weeks. We try and maintain the tank levels at 80%, we never want to have to tell the Pentagon, sorry, we need to get fuel before we go there. All you do is say, yes, we're headed there now. When Wisconsin entered the war in April 1944, all those formidable capabilities would be fully tested. Her radar and anti-aircraft batteries were crucial in protecting against kamikaze attacks on the vulnerable US carrier fleets. But it was when American soldiers had to fight the Japanese hand-to-hand -hand that Wisconsin's big guns would make their mark. In preparation for an invasion of Japan, US Marines fought a bitter campaign to clear the Japanese occupiers from islands across the Pacific region. From the Marshall Islands to Guam, from Iwo Jima and finally to Okinawa. We're trying to work our way to Japan. Uh, we know we need to conquer some key island chains so that we can have a foothold for aircraft. And so to help with that, we did shore bombardment in Okinawa, uh, again in Iwo Jima. Looking for pillboxes, that kind of thing, and softening the beachhead. Tom Mumpower served as Wisconsin's fire control officer. We're in Ford main battery plot. We're gonna control the fire of the turrets from here. I was in charge of making sure we got a proper solution on the target we were assigned.
Tom bombarded shore targets in Vietnam using the same guns as his predecessors when they supported island landings in the Second World War. The guys are on the beach, and they need help, OK? They don't have time to wait for an aircraft to sortie or that kind of thing. That's where we are very accomplished. That is, once we find the target, we can land on that target over and over again. If we were putting troops ashore, they have no better friend than a Iowa-class battleship. The Japanese defiance was finally ended when two atomic bombs were delivered by aircraft. But the greatest ceremonial honor of the war was given to a ship, the Iowa-class USS Missouri. Her foredeck was the stage for the Allies' vanquished enemy to finally surrender. The war had been a brutal, humiliating disaster for Japan, and perhaps nothing embodied the catastrophe more than the story of the most powerful battleship ever built. She is the most superb battleship that humankind has ever produced. Unfortunately, that title slips from her grasp very quickly. In 1940, as war had raged in Europe, Japan was defiantly building its military strength for the coming struggle against the USA. The Imperial Japanese Navy was already assembling an impressive fleet. Then they launched the mightiest battleship that would ever float, the Yamato. Battleships have got progressively bigger and more capable, and the Japanese build the largest super, super dreadnoughts in the world. Acknowledging they could never outbuild America in quantity, Yamato's designers opted to go big. They built a battleship that was 70,000 tons, which gave them a qualitative overmatch against a likely American battleship of the day. That was the only chance the Japanese saw in being successful against the Americans in a major fleet engagement. Yamato's hull was huge, longer than three Boeing 747's nose to tail. She was clad in 23,000 tons of armor in places over 60 centimeters thick. But it was her peerless firepower which made Yamato so fearsome. Nine 18-inch guns arranged in three turrets were the largest ever mounted on a ship. Yamato was designed to secure and maintain naval supremacy in the Pacific for Japan. Yamato, in some respects, uh, in the context of her time, was the most superb uh, battleship that humankind has ever produced. Unfortunately, that title slips from her grasp very quickly. The Pacific theater is a very different war, and battleships play their role, but there's nowhere, I don't think, where you can see it more sharper focus on the fact that battleships have to be part of a combined cohesive fleet. In the vast Pacific theater, the aircraft carrier is king. Able to deliver ordnance accurately over huge ranges. After their carrier fleet was decimated at the Battle of Midway, Japan's ability to protect its most valuable ships from US air attack was greatly diminished. Japanese battleships are being forced to operate more and more without air cover, and what this exposes is how incredibly vulnerable they are if they're not part of a balanced fleet. Admiral Yamamoto uh, rather disparagingly likened Yamato to an ancient religious scroll, the sort of thing old people and the superstitious hang up on their walls to give them comfort, but otherwise of no practical value whatever. Despite being fitted with 162 anti-aircraft guns, Yamato was kept at bay by the constant threat of attack by American planes. By the time the Americans reached Okinawa, just 257 kilometers from Japan itself, Yamato was finished as a tactical weapon. 
All that was left was for her 3,000 crewmen to join their kamikaze pilot compatriots in the ultimate sacrifice. She is sent on a do-or-die mission, really, to try and penetrate the American fleet that is surrounding Okinawa and supporting the landings there. She's sent in without air cover. The theory is she will go in at high speed, all guns blazing, and actually ground herself deliberately as an unsinkable shore battery. Long before reaching Okinawa, over 100 US aircraft unleashed a relentless attack. She put up quite a fight, but her weaponry was ineffective. Her crew were not of the quality that characterized the Imperial Navy at the beginning of the war. And she effectively suffered the same fate of any Japanese warship that tried to put out of its harbor in the spring of 1945. Finally, after 17 direct hits, the pride of the Japanese Navy detonated. A mushroom cloud six kilometers high rose into the sky. The flash of light was seen from Japan itself. All hands were lost. Yamato's inevitable demise, alongside those of Bismarck and Tirpitz, signaled the battleship had had its day. All big gun firepower alone was no longer enough. Aircraft carriers were the future. But there was one extraordinary exception. America's mighty Iowa-class battleships. The four Iowas were so capable and fitted so well into the all-powerful US carrier fleets that they alone of all World War II battleships had long post-war careers. In the decades that followed, the Iowas bombarded shorelines in Korea and Vietnam and following an extensive refit were again brought back into service by Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. The Russians at the time, I think in 1980, had about 1,700 active duty ships, and we had 400. And so there's a buildup of the fleet. And to keep the cost down, they decided they would bring back ships that were sitting in ready reserve, and we could build, refit that, and make it a modernized ship. It was 385 million to bring this ship back to life and modernize it, bring on computers and that kind of thing. But it did some tests and tried to computerize the guns, but frankly, you can't fix what isn't broken, and it works really well manipulating it by hand. Wisconsin last fired her guns and launched missiles bombarding Iraqi positions during the first Gulf War in 1991, before being decommissioned later that year. But Wisconsin and her three sister ships were preserved as regal reminders of a bygone era. To me, it's amazing, uh, you know, built in 39 months by hand, 45,000 tons of steel. You could use this ship again today. We got to throw these chains off and spruce her up a little bit and train up some good Americans. Will they? No, but that's a different story. Could they? Yes. And that amazes me. The battleship may have lost its crown to the aircraft carrier, but while they ruled, these imperious castles of steel shaped the history of naval warfare. The battleship went from being the yardstick, the currency by which navies measured their worth and importance, right through to a, a plateau where they became um, a vastly important, powerful, useful naval asset, and then kind of tipping off the end where they became a subsidiary, a nice-to-have platform able to provide gunfire support for troops ashore. I don't think we'll ever forget them. The 20th century, really, the first half of the 20th century, is dominated by the battleship. Next time, the mighty dreadnoughts. The story of how one man's vision led to a revolutionary warship that would spark an arms race. The message was modernize. Modernize or die. An arms race that would lead to the First World War and the greatest sea battle the world had ever seen. It's the story of warships so powerful that they changed the world.
And the incredible mighty dreadnought monster warship of World War I is brand new next Wednesday at 9. Next tonight we stay on the high seas joining the crew of a Royal Navy destroyer heading off on a seven-month expedition to Syria. <laughs>